Um, and thank you very much for um, for joining in this this talk. And I, I hope you're all well. I uh, trust you're all well in these very um, extraordinary time. Um, and it's nice to be talking to people in in Newcastle. I mean, I'm I'm in um, Cumbria, so be talking to people in Newcastle and Sunderland and Durham is um, is fantastic. My um, my eldest daughter still lives in Newcastle. She went to uni at Northumbria. Uh, and I've not seen her since um, uh, since February, um, so um, so it's nice to be there virtually. Um, and I think I've met many of you um, in in reality over the years. Um, not been over for a while, but I know some of you came down to Mima. Um, must be about five or six years ago now to see a. Um, a show I had, an exhibition I had about my work in Afghanistan at, at MEMA. And then I've, I've done a couple of talks with you as well over the years. So it's brilliant to be back involved and to see you. Um, and, and back then, let's just go back in time um, before March 2020. So back then, um, as an artist, uh, before lockdowns, uh, I was involved in what might be called kind of public engagement, socially engaged projects, um, where I would be meeting people, talking to people face to face, collecting stories um, from people with uh, interesting stories to tell. Uh, I did a, a big project um, with Bournemouth University about working with people living with dementia and their families and, and, and carers, for example. Um, and I also did a project, as I mentioned, in Afghanistan when I was a, a war artist in 2011. Um, and I went to, was very lucky to go to Everest Base Camp in 2016 and be um, artist in residence there. And in all of these projects, I, I, I didn't really carry um, a paintbrush or a pencil or paper. I, I, I tend to carry um, post-it notes or little note cards and I was collecting handwritten stories from people about what it was like to be in that situation. And um, they were incredibly interesting projects to do and, and quite a privilege as an artist to be in, in those situations and to meet those people. But um, that, that all finished uh, at the beginning of um, 2020, um, obviously face-to-face -face, uh, interactions as you'll have found at Chile Studios has become you know, at times impossible and at other times very, very difficult. Um, and obviously now we have things like Zoom calls, which is, you know, absolutely, absolutely brilliant to be, to kind of be, be virtually there, there with you. Um, but the impact on my art, because um, you, know, you never stop being an artist, I guess you just adapt. Um, and so the, the impact on my art practice has, 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 to be, has been that I've gone back to what I see as my first love, uh, which is painting and drawing. And um, I know these are terrible times, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm kind of enjoying my painting and my drawings. So I've, I found um, solace. Uh, I found a way of of being engaged in something, and um, I've, I found it, you know, incredibly positive for me for me to do this and I and I think you know I know a lot of people in lockdown have, have started um, um, hobbies or or hobbies plus you know kind of careers um, in in the arts and I think the, these things are are possible um, when we are forced to be in a, in a solitary setting and art, being an artist is a very uh, as many of you will know a very solitary um, activity so Today I thought I'd talk about about what it was like to go back to painting, um, and how it's helping me um, through all of this. Um, me, you know, me, me personally to kind of pick up pens and and, and paintbrushes. I, I first started um, drawing when I was at school uh, in Penrith at a time when you weren't really allowed to do art um, because it wasn't it wasn't serious enough. Uh, for you know, certainly for lots of my teachers and and, and probably for my parents as well. Um, you know, my mum's a farmer's daughter. My dad was in the police, and being an artist, you know, kind of didn't you know didn't you know fit the uh, fit the script. Um, so I remember doing art O level in my spare time during my A levels, 
Um, and then I, um, I then went into the army and, and I, was in, I was a paratrooper for about five years. And I used to carry a little tin of paint with me, um, which, I've, which I've still got. So this little, this little tin of paints here, um, which is kind of folds um, and then kind of tucks into a, a backpack. I used to parachute with that little tin of paints um, and some paper and some pens and um, some pencils. And I think my, I had some soldiers uh, working for me and I think they thought I was borderline something. Uh, they thought I was crackers. Um, uh, but but actually, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed that, um, you know, sitting in a trench in Otterburn, I remember in particular, uh, one January in the snow, um, painting and drawing this kind of landscape in front of me and the cottages down in, in the valley below. So I've, I've always done it. Um, and, and lockdown has kind of given me the chance to go back to it. Um, and so um, to talk through that with you would be would be incredible if, if that's okay. And if you've got any questions, do fire away, do do ask. And, and I know, Joe, maybe at the end, we're gonna have some time for, for questions. Like we plenty of time, plenty of time for that. Cause I'm, you know, I'd be interested to hear, you know, as we're all creatives and we're all, you know, we're all involved in the arts, how, you know, you know how what I've done can be of help um, and how your own experiences of um, how art is, is helping you. Um, and then maybe at the end, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to do a follow up um, if that was something that would be, you know, useful for, for anyone at all. So what I'm going to try and do now is, is share some um, photographs. And with a bit of luck, and the technology working, you, you'll you'll be seeing um, that that photograph we saw at the beginning. Yeah. Has everyone got that. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so we'll go through this these these slides that I've I've put together, but I'm I'm sat in my studio, uh, my as I said before, my very cold studio in Hesket Newmarket, this little village on the edge of the Northern Fells, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm in one of those houses. I'm actually just behind the pub. Uh, Eskinton Market is a very well-known pub uh, owned by the village. It's a cooperative, and at the back of that pub is is a little microbrewery, and uh, I'm I'm kind of next door to the microbrewery in the pub. Now, some people think that's a terrible thing um, situation to be in, but uh, <laughs> in, <laughs> in normal times, when the brewery's work in the pub is open and the pub. Um, opens out onto the village green. It's a very special place to be. So I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky to be here. And um, if I can just work out the next slide, here we go. Um, so without kind of turning the camera around to point out of my window, that, that, that was the view out of my window two days ago, of my studio window. So I have a little north facing window overlooking um, a tree <laughs> and some houses <clears throat> and um, covered in snow is the village green uh, and the pub is just off, off, off to the right and usually I can see some sheep if I'm really lucky. So it's a great place to um, be and it's a great place to work albeit cold and um, just going back further in time when I, when I started painting um, when I lived in Cumbria and I was very young I was, I was painting um, slightly romantic pictures of the Lake District and lakes. And I'll just show you, oh gosh, before we get to that, here are my cats. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, did put, I did put that in, but they're, they're playing with their Christmas presents. Uh, <laughs> they do often visit me in my studio and one might come in uh, if they get a bit cold, uh, but the dark one is called Cookie and the light one is called Moochie and they're, they're, believe it or not, they're sisters and they're playing with their Christmas presents here. Okay, back to, <laughs> back to the art. Um, so what I particularly love about, about Cumbria is, um, I, I love, um, I, I guess I love the fells, but I also love the, um, the fields and the patterns that fields make in the landscape. And I took this photograph about two weeks ago um, from one of the fells overlooking Keswick. 
um, and this valley below with some farms and some uh, dry stone walls and some woodlands. Um, that is the Newlands Valley and, and, and I particularly like looking down from a, a fell top on, onto that, that, those patterns of, of those fields. Uh, Wordsworth talked about this when he talked about little uh, sportive woods run wild and little copses, uh, a few lines from um, his poem about Tintin Abbey. Um, but, but he was attracted to the lines that we've made in, in the landscape and, uh, and, and so am I. And it's always been something that's interested me. But when I first started, I was in these valley bottoms painting mountain tops. And as I've progressed as an artist, I've gone to those mountain tops and looked down on those valleys because I found it more interesting to see the impact that we make on uh, this landscape. And just a few more photographs of, of where, where I live, the area I'm privileged to live in. Um, I took these um, between Christmas and New Year. I had a bit of a break from painting. I thought it was going to be about two weeks and ended up being about two days because it's quite hard to kind of put down pencils and brushes. And so I wandered around. Um, um, we, we could then wander around a little bit further down to Walswater. And I, and I took some photographs um, one day of, of the sun setting uh, as you look down towards Glen Ridding, a view that, you know, I've lived here all my life off and on, and I've never seen a sunset uh, reflection like that. Uh, utterly mind blowing, mind boggling. And something I, as an artist, I could never begin to paint. I, I just wouldn't know where to begin. And if, 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 if I painted that, no one would believe it. And I'm also a great believer in um, the line that if a photograph does the, does the job, then why, why paint it? Painting perhaps should be bringing something a little bit different than a photograph. Um, and then looking back, uh, I drove round to the other side of that lake and looked back and there was the moon. Um, and that's looking back up to where, towards where I took that photograph. Um, and photography has always played an important part in my life. And, you know, when I, was at, when I got my first job from university uh, delivering uh, bread, uh, around the Lake District um, with my first wage packet. I, I bought a little Agfa 35 millimeter camera and, um, and there started, you know, one of, one of my passions, which is photography. Um, but painting kind of came on pretty soon after that. Um, you know, this, this, this work I did uh, for my art O level, uh, which for many years was my only art um, qualification. Well, for, for for nearly nearly 30 odd years was my only art qualification and it just shows you you don't need any qualifications to be a, 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 an artist and I didn't get an A grade in art either by the way I think I actually got a C grade in art and I'm I'm still very very proud of that but these these Lakeland scenes um, in watercolor uh, probably probably with that you know with painted with those those colors um, were, were, were images like this. Um, they were um, slightly romanticized. Um, there were views from valley bottoms looking up to uh, mountain tops and kind of traditionally painted. There weren't, there weren't very many layers and I let the paint bleed uh, into, the colors bleed into each other. And I, I guess I was starting out, but I, I kind of thought this was a, a probably a more successful attempt. Uh, someone said to me the other day that if you're going to use watercolors, you need an awful lot of paper because you're going to be throwing a lot away. And uh, probably for one good watercolor painting, there might be 10 that get, get uh, turned over and started again, uh, as I would put it. Um, and then I've progressed. Um, over the years, I, in my early days as a as a, an artist, I did a lot of painting in North Wales, and um, I don't know whether there are any Welsh people on the uh, on the call here. Um, but the, the Welsh the Welsh have got a, a quite a dark view of the world, particularly in North Wales, and you know Welsh art and literature and poetry, particularly in the north, is is is, is pretty dark, and I. I got to know personally some North Welsh painters um, in, in the 1990s in particular. And what struck me most was they used a heck of a lot of black. 
<laughs> and, uh, and, um, and, and, and therefore I started to kind of um, not copy them, but, but just use a lot of black myself because I, I realized that, you know, without the black, it's difficult to see the light. And, um, you know, the, the image before didn't have any black in it at all. And the use of black really helps to emphasize um, light and color and shade. And so this was a, uh, this is a painting, um, again, quite a romantic image down, down Wastwater, Wasdale in the Lake District, looking towards at the far end, Great Gable, the kind of the mecca of, of, um, of climbing, um, of world climbing. And then I kind of progressed to adding something to my paintings that, that I could see from a little bit higher up. So I was taking a more elevated position and looking down and just noticing the lines in the landscape that we all, we all make. So in this painting of Borrowdale, um, it's still got those kind of romanticized mountain tops, but it's got some field patterns as, as I, I call them in, in the valley below and kind of light playing and changing on, on, on fields in valley bottoms is, is, is something that I find kind of hip, hypnotizing. It maybe goes back to the time when I was in, in I was a paratrooper and I was in the door of an airplane looking down on this kind of patchwork of, um, of fields below me, terrified of course about having to jump out but distracting myself by trying to see um, houses and, and, and farms. But looking down on something that that's like a patchwork planet is, is something I find really interesting. And, and in this work, it, I'm beginning to focus on um, on those fields and those patterns instead of instead of the mountains. Um, and and I, I use oil paintings. Um, I go through periods of, of using oils and at the moment I've, I've spent most of the year using since lockdown using watercolors, um, which sounds tricky in a way because watercolors are probably the hardest and I'm, I'm kind of, I feel determined to remaster watercolors and then you know I, I've got lots of oil paints but I haven't I kind of haven't got brought myself to the point of being able to use them um, I, I feel a bit nervous I guess about getting my oil paints out and I'm not ready yet to, to do that but at some point one of my new year's resolutions was to get my oil paints out and my palette knife out and start to um, create some oil paintings that they're just much more involved and, and longer term and take longer to dry. And at the moment, I like something that's shorter and immediate. And, you know, I can, you know, I can work on a piece. I was, I've been working just before this session on a, uh, a watercolor, which I'll, I'll show you here. Um, so um, I do like these orange colors and these, these, um, these kind of um, um, blues, uh, shades of blue and the contrast between them. And I was working on this earlier on and I like it because I made a bit of progress on the hills and I speed things up by getting uh, my secret weapon out, uh, which is which is a hairdryer. <laughs> uh, so I, I've, got a, um, I've got a I've got a Remington hairdryer here. I, I got a new one over lockdown because my other one burnt out. And, <laughs> and so what I do, and you may do this as well, is I, I kind of blow dry my watercolors. Uh, to, to get them to dry quickly because I'm so impatient. I just want to get on with it. <laughs> um, and and the, the other effect of, of the secret weapon is that I get to warm my hands at the same time. So I kind of leave it on for an extra minute and kind of warm, you know, warm the ends of my fingers up so I can I can <laughs> them again. But it's, it, I tell you, if you're an artist and, and use watercolors and you haven't got a hairdryer, then I'm, I'm sure you all do. But, you know, it is a, you know, it's, it's, it's a brilliant, it's like a trade secret. Um, so, so back to this oil painting here again. You can see, the, you know, the mountains are still there, but there's a focus on, on, on the fields, uh, the tree lines, the hedges, um, the stone walls, and just these little houses, little Cumbrian farmhouses dotted around, uh, with these kind of blue green slaty roofs. You know, uh, slate from Honister uh, Quarry or from um, Kirkston Pass Quarry. And it's all you know, blue or green, depending on whether they're wet or dry. I really love those rooftops of, of Cumbrian houses in the landscape. And then after a while, and this is kind of 
you know, in some senses chronological. I, you know, because my mum's, my mum's family are all farmers, uh, Cumbrian farmers. Um, you know, I've, I've been kind of almost brought up on a farm, and you know, in in you know, on a farm you see things happening all the time. So someone's turning, um, you know, they're turning something over in a field, um, you know, wheat or hay. You know, if someone turning hay over in a field makes a pattern. In, in, in that field. Someone plowing a field makes a, a pattern. Um, and so, you know, when we when we look hard at these landscapes, you know, the fields aren't all one color. Um, they're all different colors and different shades within shades, but there are there are kind of stripy patterns um, and block patterns on these fields. If you look at a field full of hay bales, it's it's like someone's put little black dots all over it. And I really like that. And so here's a painting uh, looking down Ullswater, um, which I think looking at it is a, um, I think it's watercolor, but maybe with gouache in, because it's got a slightly thicker constituency. Um, just introducing, you know, subtle, small patterns into the landscape is something I started to do. And then I, I've done that much more um, strongly in the, last, in the last six months. So this is a, a painting, I've done during lockdown, looking down towards Blencathra. Uh, so that's, a, that's a, you know, you probably know Blencathra or Saddleback on the Northern Fells. Just, you know, I live just the other side of that and a bit along. Um, and this, this valley is called St. John's in the Vale. And it's got a, it's got a really nice cottage and a road and a, a stone wall. And then it's got a little beck. And then at the, at the side of this beck, someone's turned the hay over and just created a, a pattern with um, you know bare ground and, and turned hay and, and 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 what I really like about these lines is they all lead you to a you know they lead you to a conclusion or to an end point so it's like a, you know I, I'm interested in journeys through landscapes and journeys through paintings and I you know I started a long time ago putting roads and rivers and dry stone walls and patterns that take you know maybe just take the eye to a to a kind of a, a, a destination. I'm not necessarily saying the top of Blencastra, but maybe just into that valley at the end of this painting. And so um, it's a journey for me, really. Um, and it's a guide that I use to help, you know, they're anchor points as an artist, because I, you know, I, I think I think all artists do need an anchor point, otherwise we're just kind of flotsam and jetsam, you know, washing around. And I, you know, I, 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 I've got, I think I've got a, I, I, I'm creative, but I think I've got a quite a structured mind and, and I need I need a little bit of order um, for, um, you know, for my brain to work. And, and I provide order with a road and a house, um, a dry stone wall and some field patterns. It really helps me to think. Um, and so um, here's another one. Um, again, a, lock, a lockdown uh, painting. Um, becoming a bit more abstract, I think, is is is, is a you know possibly a, a verdict on 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 the work as it's as it's progressing. Um, this is a, a painting um, uh, at Kirkston Pass, which is at the end of Bullswater, going over to Ambleside. It's a very famous mountain pass, and it was closed uh, for many days last week. But at the top of Kirkston Pass, there's a pub. Uh, called the Kirkston Pass Inn, which I'm I'm sure you know some of you may have seen or or been in. Um, and then there's a road going up the other side of that uh, of that pass called the Struggle, and it's the last quarter of a mile to the pub, and it's incredibly steep. So if you try and cycle that, it's quite hard work. Quite hard work walking it. Quite hard work driving it. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're walking up there, you can smell brakes because it's, it's one in three or one in four and it wiggles its way up and it's almost organic. And I've, I've painted this view um, in, my, in my life about 40 times. Um, you know, is it an obsession? It, it, it possibly is, but I think all artists should have, should, should have um, ob obsessions. So um, I painted it differently each time. This is the latest version, um, and I, the person who bought this, I told them I was never going to paint it again, and I hope I, I do, I do keep to that. But the reason I'm interested in in the struggle, 
and this kind of journey to this pub at the top in, in the sunlight is that my great great grandfather used to run that pub in the 1860s, 1870s, and he was called Kirkston Bill. My, my grandfather told me about this. It was like a family legend. And when he was still alive, I said, is it true about Kirkston Bill? And he said, yes. And, and I went and I went and told my mother that he, you know, my grandfather said it was true. And he said, well, my mother said, well, I wouldn't take everything your grandfather says to heart or believe everything he says. But I, I still believe the legend of Kirkston Bill running that pub. And on a very stormy night in the 1860s, the roof was lifting. So that little green slaty blue roof was, was lifting in a very strong wind that blew down the Tay Bridge. And he was quite a big guy, Kirkston Bill. And the family legend is he got out up onto those hills in the background and brought some limestone down and put them on the roof ends to hold the roof down. So if I ever have visitors who come to the Lake District, I take them to the pub to look at the views, but I point out these stones on the edges holding the roof down and say that my great, great grandfather put them up there. And most, most of them believe me, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is really nice. And I, and I believe it too. Um, but more importantly than that is, is this idea of the struggle um, that, that we all um, go through as, as human beings. And, you know, the, the struggle is the name for the road, but it's also a metaphor for the struggle that we have in life. And um, about 15 years ago, I got chronic fatigue. I got ME. Um, and it's what led me to art college. I, I wouldn't have gone to art college unless I'd got um, ME. And, you know, I, I couldn't work for quite a few years um, and, and, and went to, I did a part-time degree in Carlisle. And, um, and then that kind of changed, changed my life for the, you know, for the, for the better, mysteriously. Um, but around that time when I was, you know, was probably most ill with chronic fatigue, um, I remember, you know, doing a drive around the Lake District and it was one of the first times I'd been out and I stopped the car at the bottom of the struggle and sat on the bonnet of the car and I drew this thing. And I suddenly realized that, you know, it's a struggle, you know, the struggle is a metaphor for what we'll, we all go through. And it was what I was going through at the time. And it's why I've gone back to painting it, um, you know, dozens and dozens of times. Sometimes that these paintings are very bright and sometimes these paintings are, are very dark because I think, you know, being creative is a mirror back to our own souls and our own well-being. This is has a little bit of dark and a little bit of lighting. So I was obviously quite balanced when I, I did this. Um, but there's no there's no shame in in um, in using art to you know reflect you know how 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 we feel. I think all artists do that intentionally or not. So how do, how do I work? Um, you know what what's my working um, process? I thought I'd maybe just share a little bit of that a bit of that with you. Um, I, I mean, I, I kind of look out for subjects and uh, things to draw on the paint all the time when I'm in, in the Lake District. So I, I'm in my studio imagining myself up a mountain and thinking, gosh, I wish I was up a mountain and then I could look for inspiration. And then when I'm up a mountain, I'm looking down into a valley bottom and I'm thinking, I wish I was back in my studio doing something. And so I, you, you kind of think, well, I, you know, you can never be happy, but of course, both both are, are very happy places to be. And a couple of weeks ago, I was up on, on the fells near Keswick um, and I looked down this valley and it was quite misty, but then through the mist, um, I, it kind of cleared and the sunlight played on this valley, um, near a valley just off Borrowdale in the Lake District. And I thought that's that's what I want to do next, you know, that is the next place to go. It's a valley called Stonethwaite, um, which is which is all like a dead end valley with a, a big crag at the end of it. But it has a it has all the things that I look for in a in a composition. It's got these lovely field patterns. Um, it's got a road leading in. Um, one of those buildings down there is a pub. Um, at the end of that road, um, at the end of the valley, there's a campsite, which is the closest you can get to camping wild camping but in a campsite it's the most incredible place to camp there's a little beck running down the side which is one of the best places for wild swimming um, and in the lake district 
So, you know, that valley has, has everything for me. And there it was, um, I, I draw them out in a, in a pencil and then I use a very dark um, ivory, uh, it's called an ivory black Derwent pencil. And, uh, and I, I've been using these, these pencils for um, about 20 or 30 years. And so I've got a box full of these things here. Let's see if I can kind of stand up and show you tiny little, they're all, they're all tiny little pencils. I've got hundreds of them because I've, I've, I've ground them down with pencil sharpeners till they're, they're, all, they're all this big. <laughs> so uh, I haven't got any longer ones at the moment. So I, to use these, I either get very sore hands or I use a pencil extension to add on the end to give them uh, proper lens. But I, I make all these dark lines with that same pencil, which is a blue black Derwent pencil. And the next stage is to then add a, add a bit of color in and some patterns. So I've added some patterns to the fields, you, uh, which maybe you can see. I've, I've etched everything much more in that dark pencil. And then I started to you know, build up a bit of color um, in, in the mountains. And I've got a fair bit of, of black in there as well. Um, you know, it was a, you know, the, the valley was green, but the, the hills were, were dark and brooding. Um, and then it just takes place over the course of maybe two, three, four days to get to a point where um, I, I've kind of, you know, I filled it all in, <laughs> as they would say, um, you know, I, I filled the colors in, but I, I've kind of layered the colors and I put colors in and then, and then I kind of take them off again. You know, I use a wet brush and a, and a piece of kitchen toweling and I take the colors off again to reveal the layers below. And, and I'm just learning all the time as I go along as an artist, as we all are. And so, you know, sometimes things work and sometimes um, they don't. And I quite like putting a moon or a sun um, in, in, these, in these, some of these works um, as well in this case. Uh, it could be either a moon or a or a sun. Okay, um, I'll just talk a little bit um, as we finish um, before we get any questions about some of the work I've recently been doing. Um, there's a there's a um, an exhibition in Cumbria coming up this year, which is which is lockdown related, and I've been doing some pieces in relation to that over the last month or six weeks um you know how do we respond as artists or creative people to to lockdown and a lot a lot of people have been doing this um both for themselves and, and sharing with other people and what what i started to do was to look at isolation um you know i live in that village which is you know a lovely village um but it is incredibly isolating because you know, at the moment, everyone's keeping to themselves. You might wave at someone uh, in passing, but you don't really have any proper conversations anymore. Um, and so it's, it's the kind of the doubling effect for an artist. You're already isolated because it's a solitary activity and then you're even more isolated. And if you're in a rural area, you're, I think you're even, even more isolated. So I started to look at rural isolation during lockdown and I've created a, a just a very small group of, of paintings about this, which might might or might not go into this into this show. And so I was looking at, at these fields and these patterns and these fells, but houses in the landscape that that you know someone is in that house um, in lockdown and is very very isolated, you know, with or without transport. And, and, and the, the clue there is that someone's got a light on. So the idea of, a, you know, which I've never done before, but just a, a light on in a distant rural setting is an indication that someone's living there in, in lockdown. And, you know, light, lights on in houses have all kinds of meanings, you know, leaving a light on for someone coming home, you know, uh, people in coastal fishing ports, leaving lights on for sailors coming back, fishermen coming back, for, to, to port, um, it's kind of it's like a safe haven and, and warming, and I kind of like the idea of that. Um, and this is this is a little bit more um, forcefully done, I think, um, but it's another 
another little tiny little rural cottage. There aren't many cottages like this in the Lake District. There's one up on the Alston Fells uh, and the road up over Alston that I, I've always you know, been drawn to and painted. And this, this is probably that cottage stuck on the stuck on the Northern Fells again with a light on. But there's someone in there because they've got a fire on as well. And then he, it, slightly more um, um, removed is the idea of um, of a light on in, in on a darkening night. So you can't see the house. And this is this is the fell behind where I live. This is High Pike, and there's a farm up there. And I was out walking um, a couple of weeks ago as dusk drew in, and I could see a I could see a solitary light in a farmhouse up on the hillside. Uh, indicating that someone was there and it, it just makes you wonder about about how they're doing and what kind of life they're they're living in this incredible time we're in at the moment uh, so th those three paintings are kind of a, a response rurally and then I just want to leave you with one last image which is um, it's a piece of work I created um, I think it was just before I, or when I was at art college uh, and it's a it's a it's a painting of Carlisle I did, um, and at the time I, I at the time I painted this, um, here it is. Um, it's a big oil painting which I've still got in the house, and at the time I painted this, um, it was a kind of an observation on on um, I was I was doing some paintings and films of Carlisle at four o'clock in the morning in summer. Whereas if you film these streets, there's no, there's absolutely no one there. There might be birds or a, a car alarm going off or a flag fluttering, but there are no people at all. And for many years, the, those paintings and those films didn't have any relevance in, in a way until lockdown and suddenly empty streets became the norm. And I was looking at this painting with no one in it, no people, no cars, no sign of life, just buildings. And I and I, I thought I'd maybe breathe a bit of life back into it as part of a response to lockdown. So I, I added to this painting, I added some lights. So I don't know whether you can see, but there are, I can barely see myself to be honest, but somewhere in this painting, there are three lights on and, and there are also three solitary figures. Um, you can see one in the middle of the plaza in front of the Citadel buildings. Um, and so I've added those those three lights and those three figures to this landscape. And so after after you know ten years after starting that painting, I've, I've I feel I finally finished it. And you're just waiting for you know that that kind of it was waiting for this this moment. Um, it is it is complete, and, and so is my talk. <laughs> <laughs> Move. <laughs> um, so, shall I, shall, I, shall I just stop that share now okay. and go back to the main screen? And uh, yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. I'm sure Thank you. tons of questions, I think, from everyone. So, yeah, please. Yeah, I'd love, love to answer questions. Could I ask a question, please? Debs. Um, uh, these these last pictures that you've done, they're really dark, but yeah. you've 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 then that makes the light very uh, very strong point of focus. But when you were actually painting them early on, were you were you were you aware of the impulse to put the light in? Were you just painting dark and then put the light in because you felt you must do that to keep that balance or create that order? Were you setting something right there in the process of painting, would you say? I think I was really, yeah, because I, I, I've never, you know, I've never, you know, one thing I've, I've never done in my work is I've never included the human form. Yeah. For example, so I'm, you know, Anthony Gormley, for example, always includes the human form. Um, I'm an artist that doesn't, I mean, I don't have sheep, I don't have, tractors or people or anything in, in these landscapes. Um, and it's partly because, you know, I, when I was at college, I did some life drawing classes, but I, ne I never thought I was very good at it, to be honest. And, and so partly it's, um, you know, safety for me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, art's very exposing, isn't it? <laughs> you kind of, you put something 
down and then you put it out there like in this in you know this this chat today or on instagram and you know the the, the kind of the feedback um can be quite you know brutal or uh, quite direct um and and whether it's direct or not you still feel it as an artist you, you your kind of critical eye and so i i've never you know i've never included any um apart from the, the historical things that we've made like the dry stone walls and buildings i've never included people or lights and so you know just adding that um over the last few weeks and months you know adding that little bit of light uh into the into that work um or just you know adding a, a bit more light into into a very dark piece of work is is maybe something about hope yeah. um, which i think is an important word isn't it and so yeah. I, I don't know whether it's i'm giving myself hope in that work i mean i'm i'm kind of not i, I mean as artists we we kind of mainly do work for ourselves i think i mean i i don't paint for a, an audience um so i guess it must be for me so i'm kind of leave putting a light on for me um yeah or yeah. Giving, you know giving hope for me i mean my, my parents live in penrith and they're in their 80s and they've just had their first vaccination which is brilliant but you know i'm kind of i'm you know which i'm now hopeful uh yeah you know when when you know before that i wasn't so i I think hope, if hope is something that is coming out in my work because of this, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, thank you. We had a, um, a technical question from Leanne um, about what's the material you use to paint on? Does that change as well? So what um, yeah. piece? Yeah, thanks Leanne. I, I, um, with the water, with watercolor um, um, painting, I, I uh, started using a really thick, um, well, it's a type of paper, Saunders Waterford um, paper, which is um, the heaviest weight you can get. And it's it's like, it's bomb proof. So you can, you know, I went through a, a stage of, of really physically attacking the paper and kind of carving bits out and tearing off strips. I don't do that as much now, but what, what is brilliant about this paper is that it's, it's it is, nothing comes through the other side, but I, I often, um, after I've done those drawings in, black and white, I often stand stand up in the studio and I throw, literally throw paint on to, to the paper with a paintbrush uh, so that all the all the, the black watercolour bleeds out and creates kind of, you know, it's a, creates an accident or, or two on the paper, which I then, which I then kind of work into the final piece. And if the paper is very thin, it starts to starts to kind of fold at the edges and starts to deckle and curl. Um, so this remains flat, and I can kind of do anything to it. But the other brilliant thing about using this really thick Saunders Waterford paper is that if I don't like what I'm doing, I just turn it over and start again. And you can't do that on thin watercolor paper. So I kind of get two for the price of one. You know, often I I'll, I'll do a, a a piece on the back of something else, and that I've kind of lost fallen out of love with and then um, you know someone might buy it and get it framed and I'll say well there's another bit on the back <laughs> you know, if, you, if, you get, if you get fed up with it just take it out and turn it over and you know there might be, there might be a drawing of Carlisle on the back or something like this um, so yeah it's a quite quite thick paper and then I um, I use um, I use tubes of watercolor as well as as well as these you know as well as these kind of um, little um, you know palette things uh, I also I also use um, I use these tubes you know, which are tiny, <laughs> so um, these are um, uh, Windsor and Newton I think artist quality, and but it means I can get I can really layer it up. So sometimes they look a bit like kind of go ash uh, into you know into oil almost because I'm just kind of using really heavy impasto water watercolor, which I'm sure is you know probably frowned upon um and it may be a terrible waste but i i kind of like a lot you know i build up layer after layer by by i just often get the tube and i just squeeze it onto the paper and then work it in <laughs> and then and then get the hairdryer out <laughs> it's not pleasant we've got uh louise next hi uh hi louise i'm just curious about what make your very first watercolor 
uh, box that you showed us was because I've I've still got mine from 50 years ago okay. well, yeah, I think and, you best. and it was a really good quality I really loved it yeah um and I don't seem to be able to get the same quality watercolor blocks yeah well I, 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 I do agree with that um but you you've bettered me because I think this is probably this is I think this is probably about 1980 I think I'm sure I had this at university at Durham in fact and uh, it is a uh, let's have a look at this uh, it's Rembrandt oh, oh. The, um, that's, that's not a bad brand is it <laughs> sounds very impressive <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't, yeah. um, I've never realized that before it's called Rembrandt <laughs> artist watercolor um, aquarel poor artist yeah so it's 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 a Rembrandt Right. Can I also just, sorry, can I just also ask a quick question? Is there such a thing when you look at watercolour palettes now that you can get things called transparent watercolour and slightly opaque? I think you can. I think it, I think it depends can. on on the mix. I mean, someone else may be able to uh, correct me here, but I think it depends on on, on, on what, what, what's actually uh, mixed in with the, the colour. Right. Um, so you might, you might get a mix in that's an opaque mix. Mm. Um, you know, there, obviously it's all water soluble. Um, yeah. But um, there are some gum elements within watercolours which make it uh, opaque. So I, I think you can get the same colour either in a transparent luminescent uh, or, or, a, or in a in a, a slightly semi-opaque. Right, so thanks. Someone might correct me here, like Carol or someone. <laughs> or Jamie. Well, I, was, <laughs> I wouldn't correct you, but um, funny <laughs> enough, it has come up in a, another forum recently because um, I was gifted some old materials from my partner's granddad who um, gave this array of stuff. Um, and one of the ingredients was glycerin. Um, yeah. So I asked what you would do with it. And um, people said, oh, you can use it as a thinner um, with watercolours and inks and stuff like that, so you could create your own translucency using different mm. substances like that. All right. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll show you in my little cupboard of uh, glory on uh, Wednesday, Louise, or Thursday. Okay. Or, <laughs> and I'll show you what I've got because there's all kinds of stuff that I would never have thought of that um, uh, Michael's granddad, Ken, used to use in his watercolours. Um, so yeah, we can have a little explore. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I've got, uh, old, well, it's not old. It's old. A Japanese set, which is a bit more opaque. Opaque. Um, a mm. cure take. But well, it just seems to be a lot more opaque and, and very bright, actually, and tiny little bit sheeny on the surface as well. But it's it's a nice set. To you. I quite like the fancy idea of a transparent. Yeah. Yeah. I also have some Japanese um, watercolors that I use. So, um, yeah. <laughs> 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 I used to have some there, <laughs> um, which are which are fantastic. I'm still on the call, am I? That's brilliant. Uh, it literally fell into my into my um, keyboard. Um, oh dear. So, um, so they have they they come with these lovely. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, you probably have these. Is that the same one as you, Joe? Oh, yeah, look. Nice. Yeah, no, it's quite. We all have to get some. <laughs> yeah, get some for the studio, Carol. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know what they are. They're called um, they're, they're Kisco Gansu. Oh, yeah. Uh, they're called the Kisco Gansoi, I think. I could always let you have that link if you want. Um, yeah. But they are, they are so beautiful, those colours. And you cannot, you cannot get some of these, these colours. There's a, there's a blue here that I use all the time you can see that it's nearly all gone and it's just this lovely um kind of like a cobalt blue but not nothing that you can get in in this country and it just does something else and and, and that's quite opaque that that blue so it, it, it um, it's quite good as a, as a base layer uh -huh. um, but yeah i love my japanese my japanese paints there's a question from lawrence as well Hi there, I really enjoyed your talk, thank you. Um, so I think it was about um, when you were saying that one in 10 pieces when you were watercoloring, like were, were like the good one. And I also kind of love the idea of keeping that light on for yourself. So I suppose my question was, 
as an artist and I suppose an artist with experience how is it that you've processed that like maybe doubt and fear and anxiety and how have you left that light on for yourself um so I suppose how have you worked through the natural anxieties that come with being an artist and do you have any kind of advice um that you could give to other people who'd maybe also be worried about how to put themselves out there or um, having anxiety exploring like new art forms or just exploring in general yeah no it's a it's a good question and it is um i i sometimes wonder how 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 one or i do overcome it because it it, it seems to be an almost daily daily battle really um I think there are two, there are two, there are two battles going on. One is the, one is the kind of the private battle, isn't it, that you have in your own head about you know, when you're doing something and um, whether something's working or not, um, and when to give up. Um, one of the things I have learned um, is 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 rarely to give up. I think that's, you know, rarely to give up on a piece. I, you know, I, I never finish a, a piece of work in a day. Um, so there's always tomorrow, <laughs> you know, there's always a chance of going back in tomorrow. And um, it's a bit like crosswords, you know, when you, when you look at it, you can't see, you can't see the answers, but then a couple of days later, you can straight away. And it's a bit like that with creative processes. You, you know, I, I find when I'm working on a, a piece that I, I, I can't seem to find the solution to the, the problem. I kind of, I'm, get, I'm getting better at knowing what the problems are, which isn't always a good thing. And certainly, going, you know, when I went to art college, I developed a more critical eye about my own work. And I think that's that's kind of, you know, and I, before that, it was just looking at galleries. And obviously now you can't do that, but looking at stuff online. Um, and I think Instagram, for example, because it's very visual, I just, you know, it's, it's been such a kind of learning process looking at other people's work and just thinking, you know, how did they do that? Or... Um, you know, being critical. So, you know, that, that critical process you go through yourself in relation to a piece of work or even just beginning, um, you know, is, is one battle, but I, 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 you vary from day to day. So I've learned not to become too precious and there's always a walk on the hill to clear the mind, um, which I, you know, for me, just a bit of physical activity or, or exercise, just I can often work out a problem and then come back to it the next day. So, you know, I, I think it's a it's it's a bit of a long game being an artist uh, in many ways. You know, just just solving a problem inside your head, and then thinking, well, you know, why didn't I think of that at the time? I, so often that happens to me. Um, so you develop a bit of a bit of a confidence, um, you know, in in that sense. And then you know the the other pressure is the external pressure, you know, of. Um, you know, not, not all work needs to be shared. So those nine pieces that end up, you know, end up, you know, on the on the cutting room floor, as they say, you know, like, you know, these are these are pieces of it's a piece that maybe didn't work. Um, so I've cut it up and I'm using the back of it to scribble notes on or something like this. And I, I kind of tend to keep all all the work somewhere. I'm not kind of I don't burn I don't burn all my all my other you know all, all my failures I've still got them I think that's quite a good thing to to do because you can always go back to them um, but when you put your work out there there's an, you know there's another another kind of battle or trial and you know I, I, you don't have to put your work out there but I, I find that it other people's views of your work is kind of is kind of interesting and terrifying um and it, it's all part of developing your own critical eye um and i think if if you can overcome um that fear which which we have to do daily then i think it's it's, it's a good thing like a, it's like a peer review it's like a crit a critical discussion um um in this case with mostly with people you've never met but you know you can kind of develop a, a bit of trust and and so on so i, I started putting my paintings on Instagram um, at the beginning of the year. And I was lucky because I, I kind of got a lot on before uh, lockdown and then I've kind of built on that. And I, and I, you know, I paint every day. I don't always put something online every day. Um, but when I do, um, and again, Carol, I know you, you're, you regularly put work online and 
and I see it, I, I think it's utterly terrifying. Um, you know, I, it's, um, yeah, it's a really scary, scary process. But what I have found is it's helping me to evolve. And so if I can overcome the fear and just get it out there and then, and then just, you know, it's, it's not even the, you know, it's not about the likes or people telling you they like it. It's, it's about me putting it up and then I might look at it two days later and think, I, I can see what I, I can see now, what, what, I, what I would have done differently. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and, I, and I think that's the, that's the value of putting it on, online. It gives you a different, different eye. We had a question, yeah, think, Ali, as well. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, I think there's a quite a community as well, isn't it, that you can benefit from from that interaction yeah. among Very people. Nice it's not, it's not all about acceptance. Um, yeah. But it, there is a kind of um, a solidarity of people and support with each other. Yeah. Um, that is helpful. But you can always edit after the fact as well. It's not, it's not there forever. You can always <laughs> delete it. Yeah, exactly. Later on, doesn't matter how many likes it's got. If you don't like it, it doesn't matter. But as you say, you'll have learned something from it. Yeah. Because it, it is a different. Once it goes into that little pictogram square, mm. it's a different thing, and it doesn't belong to necessarily just you anymore either. No, that's true. Um, but it's quite nice as well. I think I'm I'm sort of more inclined to sort of share the workings of my mind, whether they relate to the work that I'm producing or not at the time now as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's good to see. Um, I'm, so, I'm, less, I'm less inclined to do that. Yes, you are. You are less inclined. I haven't got that. You've got a very beautiful <laughs> grid as well. <laughs> a very cohesive, beautiful grid. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Ali, would you like to? Yeah, it, it sort of leads on from what um, Lawrence was saying. I think, how do you, ma and, um, is it okay to quickly talk about your work in Afghanistan? Yeah, of course, Ali, yeah. Because you've gone back to painting now, but about looking at your work that you did was completely different. How it was collating stories, wasn't it? It was very, on the post-it notes, and made into that yeah. beautiful book, which was incredibly, you know, it's incredibly moving. But I wondered how you manage people's expectations as an artist, because obviously you work across a range of media. Do mm -hmm. people expect when you go to, say, the base camp of Everest or Afghanistan, do they expect a very traditional approach? which is more the painting or what have you, or do people just get it and understand it and participate? So lots of questions. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think they, um, I think they, you know, you can't manage the expectations of, 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 of the audience who, who want to take part in these projects like in Afghanistan. So, you know, they, they will have heard in advance, you know, that an artist is coming, um, but, you know they they still have their suspicions so you know artists sometimes get lobbied in the same group with with journalists so they they're there with an agenda and so that that's something that needs to be overcome um and you can do that face to face and you know uh, just by chatting and then meeting you and, you know you need a bit of trust for those projects to work um but they do expect you know without you know when they hear an artist is, is coming they do expect easels Mm -hmm. um they do it they, they want they want to yeah. see an easel and they want to see a, they want to see paper and pens and paints and you know they want to see a beret and a cape <laughs> and uh so when you turn up and you've got a lot of those i mean I, I i always when i went to everest and when i went to afghanistan i always did take um pencils and paper and things with me because i i want i also wanted to to draw you know never stop drawing is you know, it's something that we have inside us, uh, but it was never the thing that was prominent. So I had to then talk to them about the work um, and obviously try and explain it clearly so that they might want to take part. But, you know, to answer the question, they, they seem to get it straight away. Right. You know, at first they thought it was kind of funny, really, that an artist turns up without a berry and, a, and, a, and a, an easel. And then, they, <laughs> and then they think, actually, you know, I can relate to this um because you know not, not all people can relate to artists working in their studios painting and drawing and things like that they, they it's, an, it's such an abstract concept i mean most of my family can't can't relate to me being an artist i mean it just, it just doesn't you know they, i think i'm sure they still wonder what i do um you know what, what do you do all day 
and <laughs> how is that and how is that a job <laughs> and um and so um you know when when you're collecting stories it's much more real to the to, to the to the participant and and then to audiences I mean I you know I found with that kind of work you know that when it was at MEMA and things like this the Afghanistan work that you know people were kind of you know moved in a way that you would hope you could move them through a painting but I, I don't think I'll ever be able to do that through painting in, in the same way um, so they kind of get the they got the power of it um, but I, I kind of obviously I can't do that work anymore but I also I also personally found it incredibly draining uh, those projects it took me almost a year to recover from the Everest project you know with, with you know once you've had ME then it kind of creeps back every so often and kind of kicks you and so I you know I was incredibly depressed and and low energy when I got back from Nepal uh, which which is a you know, if you spent time at altitude, then a lot of a lot of climbers get incredibly depressed after they get back, uh, which is psychological and physiological. But I, I, I just couldn't. You know, I just can't do those things anymore. Uh, I don't think. Um, and so I, I kind of love just coming into my studio and I put my radiator on and and I put you know BBC Radio Cumbria on, and I put my light on and then I tidy up my scrow. And then I pull down an art book and then have a read of it. And then I tidy a bit more scrown and I sharpen those pencils until they're only, a, you know, an inch long rather than two inches long. And then you know, eventually I might put a bit of paper down and start doing some black lines. But, you know, that is such an, you know, I don't know, I just, it's liberating. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we had a question from Talia as well. I wanted to ask with the chronic fatigue and E, how do you balance the, I have fibromyalgia um, and there are days I want to create, but because of brain fog or pain or just lack of energy, I can't, but then I beat myself up that like, I really want to do this. I should be doing this, but I physically can't. How do you, how do you balance that for yourself? Not very well. I think that's the answer. Um, it's, in, it's incredibly frustrating. Um, you know, I want, I probably like you, I want to do far more than I can. Uh, so if I, if I go and walk on the hills, um, you know, trying to look at, you know, find, find subjects or inspiration, it, you know, I, I know that probably not the next day, but the day after that, I'm probably not going to be able to do very much. And I, I, you know, I just find it frustrating that, you know, obviously we, you know, we all want, more time than we have but we'll you know we want some of us want more energy than we we have and i i just you know i've never been very good at coping with that um i mean i i i don't do lists anymore you know that that's that's a real help um it means i could be a, you know a bit you know i can get away with being a bit more disorganized but um creatively i it's not you know being a creative is is a draining experience um so you know I, I i don't spend all day um in the studio i maybe work for two or three hours and that that is it um and there used to be a time before you know when i used to paint before i had me i used to go through the night you know i could paint all night um and i i can't do that and i find that incredibly frustrating but i think i think the one the one good thing about um being having less time is that you, you you maybe use it better and and i found that there's you know there's an intensity in in my time in the studio that i get these days that i maybe didn't get before and i i always hope that that intensity translates into my work because i'm kind of looking for you know i'm looking for something that that is an, an intense outcome um and I, and I think that's one of the benefits of, of, of having limited time. So, you know, the, advi the advice is that, you know, you can do, you can probably do more than, you know, in that limited time than, than you, than, or, or, or stronger in that limited time than you could be before. So I like to see that as a positive. Thank but you. Then, but then, but then go, but then, you know, don't be guilty about reading a book or doing a crossword or lying down. That's the other thing. <laughs> you know, I, and I, you know, I'm getting gentler with myself, but maybe that's age. Hmm. 
Um, Thank you. A few more questions. We've got um, Francis. Yeah, I was going to say you said something. You said about being more disorganised. Can yeah. I just reword this? What you really mean is more flexible. I do. <laughs> isn't that an, and isn't that a brilliant thing? Yes. I was going to say, <laughs> the chances are that you're more organised mm -hmm. rather than disorganised, but more flexible. I just, I just couldn't, I'm sorry, I couldn't let that one go. It's like, no, you're flexible. You're flexible. <laughs> when you've got a health problem, you become flexible. So well, that's it, sorry, thank you. <laughs> no, but I, I can kind of, if I just... Move, the, move my camera. I can, I can also show you a bit of disorganised here as well. Ah, oh, no, that's organised chaos. <laughs> <laughs> chaos is always needed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I like, I like it. I, I know where everything is. I was going to say actually, I could. It's better than this. It's like there's nothing there. There's nothing. No. I'm in a, I'm in a white. <laughs> I'm very fortunate. I get to start again. <laughs> so in six months' time, that will be oh. covered in things, will it? Sorry, not the frozen. 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 Oh. A bit of a bit of freezing <laughs> going on. Give it, give it a shake. Yeah, exactly. That works. <laughs> works. I think that shook if it worked. It's like banging, <laughs> like banging, banging the TV, isn't it? Yeah, move the aerial around. <laughs> yeah. I had a, a question. Um, just looking at your, your kind of installational social work um, compared kind of to the paintings. Um, mm -hmm. I initially found that such a contrast, but um, listening to you describing the pieces, it's still very much about the human story, the human experience yeah. um, and storytelling to a part as well. Um, yeah. Do you feel that you need to directly experience something to create? So being on top of the mountain has given you that image, being yeah. in the base camp with people and stories has, made, has enabled you to kind of create in that respect. Yeah, I, I don't see how you can do this as an abstract concept, yeah. really. I mean, I, I don't think I'll ever be an abstract artist. I mean, I, 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 I did try once, but I, I couldn't, I, I, you know, I know a lot of people who are brilliant abstract artists I just I, I obviously don't have that kind of brain I you know it has to be something tangible in it and immersive for me um you know yeah I think I kind of ha feel like I have to have lived it a bit um in order to be able to um represent it um and and I do like the idea of a story within within a landscape or a story within um a piece of public engagement you know i think you know I, I love to be able to tell a story and if i can't tell a story i'll i'll tell someone else's story um so you know telling the story of of coaxed and bill through paintings is you know i think that's the same as um a carer telling the story of what it's like to you know to, to live with someone with dementia I, I i i used to struggle with that you know that difference, Joe. I, you know, I used to try and think, well, then I've got to find a connection here, and then I kind of realised after a while that the connection was always in my head. And, and you know, I, and, and whether someone else sees that connection doesn't doesn't seem to matter. It's funny because I, I was, um, you know, I, when I was when I was working with Mima, for example, I would never tell them oh, I I also paint, and. And, and recently some, some of them have kind of, you know, kind of some people from MEMA have kind of, you know, engaged with my paintings and said, they said, is that, is that you that's done those paintings? <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's a new, you know, it's, it's, it's the other half of me. And they've gone, well, that's, that's, that's cool. And I thought, well, that's, that's nice. Um, your art kind of reminds me a bit of um, the, uh, the genre of uh, sublime art, you know, these very big kind of, the only way I can kind of describe, well, for those who don't know what I mean, is kind of like these kind of things. You know, um, actually, <laughs> hold on, it's a, it's a bit too, a uh, bit too bright, hold on. Um, yeah, that's all it. Is, you know, these, you know, you know, the, the mist, uh, 
It's that's Casper Friedrich, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, that that's uh, that's what uh, some of your art kind of reminds me of, like these big, huge, you know, uh, things, um, which which is which is really impressive. Um, I would I would I'd recommend uh, like looking into like the whole uh, genre of like sublime art. Um, really really cool stuff. Um, Okay, I will, I will do that. I mean, I've, I've always liked his work. You know, the yeah. idea of a figure looking into, into the distance. I've really, I've really loved that. And people like Monk as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I, thank you, Kerry. I, I, will, I will look into that. I mean, the sublime is, is a kind of interesting notion because it, it kind of suggests beautiful, doesn't it, I think? Mm -hmm. also, it's, it's, it's kind of the feeling of existential dread and then that kind of rapturous kind of joy that you kind of feel afterwards yeah um which is kind of cool a cool concept like i, I think uh, uh Edmund, Edmund burke uh did a um uh thing about uh about like the sublime and like the psychoanalysts they did a like jung and freud and lacan and all of them did a with their psychology they did a few things around uh sublimation which is really interesting, uh, interesting stuff. I'd recommend it. Yeah, indeed. And Wordsworth as well, uh, you know, fellow Cumbrian, he, he talked about the sublime quite a lot. And I often think about him because he, he, he once talked about gallivanting around when he was young and leaping from rock to rock and <laughs> rock to cataract and various things and uh, like, a, like a kind of a wild roe or a wild deer. Yeah. Um, and never, never kind of, you know, never really connecting with with nature, and mm -hmm. as he got older, he kind of slowed down, and started to look and started to see and started to see that to see that kind of that kind of beauty and to feel it himself. Yeah, it's um, kind of like piercing the veil, which is pretty cool. I like it. Yeah, yeah. I'll just make a note of that. <laughs> thank you. Um, Great, Kerry. Thank you. We've got time for maybe one or two more, if that's okay, Eric. Um, yeah, another from Francis. So you're coming up with Kerry. It may not be Kerry, by the way. Yeah, it's That's Philip. Philip, oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Philip. Right. Do you know what I noticed in your in your paintings that your houses at the end are at the end of the road? Right? I just looked and thought, oh, it's at the end of the road. Now is that because where you live, the houses are literally at the end of the road? Or is it because it's just uh, a nice, is it just good practice to have an end point in your paintings? That's a good question, yeah. I don't really, I don't know the answer to that. Um, um, I, um, I mean, I, this, this idea of a journey through a landscape maybe suggests that you're, you're journeying to, to somewhere that maybe is home. Um, and maybe that links with the idea of, you know, this idea of having light, a light on, kind of light, light the idea of that. I don't think I've subconsciously done that. And so I'm, so I don't think I've consciously done that. So maybe it's a, a subconscious process. Um, I often do things in, in threes um, within, a, within a painting. So I'll maybe have three buildings kind of in a, in a triangle within, within the work. Um, but, um, I don't think it's a conscious thing, but I really like the idea of that, and I'm going to steal it. <laughs> it was just, it, it stood out, it was really glaring. You could go in, but there was only one way in and one way out. You couldn't go beyond it. It Never. was just, a, I, I'm one of those people, I, I do houses without door handles. You can't <laughs> even get into mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, that's, a, that's a whole new thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't always have windows or doors, by the way, because they're, they're just blocks, you know, they like, you know, Rachel Whitred's blocks, you know, that she used to do, you know, cast, casts of interiors of houses. You know, I, I like the idea of that, but door handles, gosh, that's a, that's a whole new concept. Or lack, lack of. of. A lack of, yeah. Oh, you know, and definitely no post box, because who wants to, who wants to receive that post? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, I've got a thing. I mean, I don't paint houses. I, I um, 
where I have a real thing when I'm when I'm going down the street. I love windows. Uh, I, I, love, <laughs> I love windows. I love the crookedness of windows and doors in old buildings and yeah. that age that seeps into them. And as as you were saying about um the one the great 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 granddad putting things on the roof to hold his roof down. Yeah. You know, I'd notice that, but I wouldn't notice that necessarily that I have a castle to my right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just random. Sorry. Yeah. It's all right. No, no, I'm I'm I'm, I'm with that because my the doors of my studio um, sometimes it opens all right. Um, well, Derek, you're breaking up. I don't know. Yeah. That's going on other people's? Yeah, it's broken yeah. from mine as well. Oh, he's a bit frozen. Bad, doesn't. Sorry, you're back, I think. Oh, you're back. Yay! <laughs> you broke up a little at the end yeah. there, Am Derek. Am I going in and out? Or are you're you all back going in now. And out? Yeah, you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Is it me that. that's freezing? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, missed what you said at the you're end. Back. Sorry about that. I think you're back properly now. Yeah. Was there any further questions? Um, it's been a, a brilliant talk, and thank you so much. Really enlightening, and just a beautiful journey through you. your work. And um, yeah, and then yeah. It was fantastic. Um, is there any further questions? Will you let us know when the Cumbrian exhibition comes together? Yes, I will do, actually. Yeah, I think it's going to be in March. Yes, um, the spring. So I, I will, yeah, mm. the spring, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be the other, on part, kind of partly on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, meet, we'll meet you on the other side, Derek. <laughs> 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 We will, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll definitely put all the links, we've put, well, nearly as much as I can find them, the links that we've chatted about. Um, I'll put them on our Facebook group um, if people are interested, they can follow those further. Yeah. Um, but massive thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for the questions. Brilliant. Great to talk Brilliant. to you. Really, really yeah. Really. Yeah, thanks, Derek. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.